So the last lecture we concluded by coming up to the point of timing. Now, timing moment is a function of theta, the crank angle, and most for the most of the other terms, we actually worked out the uh, expression for that in terms of theta itself, except the gas pressure. That force we wrote as P into A, cross section of the piston. Right? Now, say this is the cylinder, this is the piston. So, the engine operates in a cycle, as you know, from other courses, or you will learn from other courses. Now, a typical four stroke engine operates in four strokes com suction, compression, expansion, and expansion. So, in the first um, stroke, from this end, which is called the outer dead center position of the piston, the piston moves like this. And then in the next stroke, it moves back. So this is third. In, in the first uh, first one, the suction stroke, it works from the inner dead center to outer dead center. That is from here up to here. And when it starts in a four stroke engine, so a valve opens the inlet of the cylinder and um, fresh charge air and air to air or air to mixture enters here and since the piston is moving this way so inside the pressure is less and from, from the outside the charge comes easily so that is basically it is getting sucked so that is why it is a suction stroke and in the next stroke that is as the crank goes to the extreme and starts coming back then the piston starts going back and just around that time this valve closes the suction ends and the charge is fresh charge is trapped here and that is compressed and at the end of the compression the ignition either happens quickly or stops depending upon what kind of engine you are using. So after that, the anyway the crank is moving away now. So the and inside with the ignition, the temperature and pressure rises. Basically, it is a pressure rise which is of our utility. Then this gas expands. And it comes to this point. This is the stroke in which basically the engine is delivering power. <coughs> so suction, then compression, then expansion, which is also called the power stroke. Expansion stroke and power stroke is the same thing. And then at the end of that, when it starts coming back again by turning of the crank, then this piston pushes out, but this time it is not compression because around this time the outlet valve gets open and the current passes are pushed out and this cycle begins. So you will see that one cycle, one thermodynamic cycle gets completed here in four strokes, which means two complete rotations of the gas. 0 to pi, pi to 2 pi, then 3 pi, then 4 pi. So this Special profile in terms of theta, you know from the indicator diagram, which is essentially the PV diagram, or you can say equivalently PX diagram, because the volume is basically volume yeah. swept through is basically equal to constant cross section area into X swept through. So PV diagram or PX diagram is the same thing. Now, since we know X as a function of theta, so 
from the indicator diagram, we basically get P as a function of P. And from the indicator diagram, which you will find in the book, when you work out the, take the pressure and work out the force, <coughs> the force looks like this. That is, initially, the force is negative because basically you have to pull it towards the right side. And you remember that in our typical diagram, we had the positive direction this way. So it is this way, force, this way, pressure. So it is a negative. And then in compression, the pressure operates upward, inward. Okay. So in compression, actually the crank has to do a lot of work. Okay, here also the crank is doing a lot of little work. Here also expansion. So with compression, this pressure goes high. Obviously, that is compression. At the end of it, flow ignition, the power gets developed and delivered through expansion. Delivered through the piston through expansion. At the end of the third stroke, then the exhaust valve opens and it starts to And in this entire process, the inertia force of the piston is a liability. It has to be spent. Okay. So that is uh, very small. Okay. So negative like this, then positive like this, and so on. In this angle. So together, you will get the resulting pressure distribution, which is our force, force uh, profile, which is the theta, which will be a little further from here. And that force actually we use in the definition of the current. Right? So as you see that the force is quite non uniform. And therefore, the turning moment that you will get will also be non uniform. And it will be it is something like this. As usual, as expected, in a third stroke, there will be a lot of positive moment. In all the other three strokes, the moment further sometimes actually spent using negative also is certainly lower than the resisting moment or the load, which is the output of the engine at the pressure, which is like this. Now, MR, the resisting moment or the required moment, which is the load, that depends upon the kind of use to which you are putting it. Right? Often, it is constant. If you are, if you are applying it for a constant load kind of operation, which is most of the time the case. But not always, not necessarily. Okay. Now, that means that the kinetic energy of the pen changes quite often. So, if you try to work out the change in the kinetic energy from one crank angle to another crank angle, then basically you and total energy delivered to the crank in a cycle, you can work out when you take the cycle, which is from zero to capital theta. And for a force load engine, the capital theta will be four times because you have four strokes, two crank angles, two crank rotations. And for two stroke engines, it is two times, which is one full crank rotation. And this total energy, if you divide that by this theta, capital theta, so therefore by R by theta, this kind of energy, then you get the average moment, average moment. Now, for continuous stable operation at a constant speed, this average turning moment developed by the engine must be equal to the constant load. If it is not, if they are not equal, depending upon which one is more or which one is less, the 
RPM, the angular velocity may keep on increasing continuously or keep on decreasing. So, per stable operation at a constant speed, constant angular velocity, these two are equal. Now, even when these two are equal, over cycles, the angular velocity does not change much or does not change. But during the cycle, the instantaneous angular velocity may keep on changing quite badly. Okay. So, how badly that may change, you can evaluate that by again looking at the turning moment diagram. Say, this is a general schematic turning moment diagram. And if this is the load moment, then the total area under this, total area under this is equal to the total energy developed by the in a cycle. Fourth over this flow cycle is equal to the total area under this MR, which means that MR is basically as we have already said. So then during this segment of the crank compression from A to B, A to B, the crank will gain continuity energy, then it will lose, then it will again gain energy, then it will lose, then it will gain, and it will So whenever turning moment is above the load moment, the crank will gain energy and vice versa. Right? So if you want to Find out how much is the maximum energy fluctuation. Then, out of these different areas, positive energy, positive energy, you need to work out the nothing. So, in this diagram, the way it is shown, this area is the nothing. So, E max minus E min, E max will be at P, E min will be at A. So, there is P here. E max minus E min will be the difference between energies at these two times. And that will be equal to this little area, this and this, bounded by MR below and M above from A to B. And that will get like this. MR below, M above. The difference M minus MR. So when you integrate it from this angle to this angle, this crank angle to this crank angle. To get the maximum energy fluctuation. So, from that maximum energy, it will again reduce from B to C and then again reduce it will never go up to the B level and so forth. Now, there are two coefficients which are generated coefficient of fluctuation of energy. This delta K max, when you divide it, by the total energy developed by the engine over the cycle, then you get what we call as a coefficient of fluctuation of energy. And similarly, if you work out the maximum variation in the angular velocity and divide it by the average, then what you get is the coefficient of fluctuation of energy. Now, you can examine the relationship between these two. But before that, we try to address the issue quality. There are three engineering tricks. The entire engineering is basically tricks. The rest of the engineering that will do is science. The real engineering is basically a lot of tricks. So there are three engineering tricks to reduce this speed fluctuation. One is two -fold. In four stroke engine, there is a lot of energy fluctuation because out of four strokes, only one stroke gives you power. That also sometimes high rate of power delivery, sometimes low. Okay. And the rest of the three strokes actually power is continuous for the movement of the engine parts itself. If you could have a power stroke in every two strokes rather than every four strokes, then half the cycle there would be some. Power. So, an extremely clever design of the piston shape 
to open and close the inlet and exhaust holes by the shape of the piston itself, the figure size piston. And as the piston moves away from a little opening, it opens and the other one closes and so on. So that way, if, when you see the picture in your energy systems textbook, you will find the preferred picture. Okay. So that is why in two stroke engines, the inlet and exhaust ports open suddenly. And that is why when such an engine you start without a silencer, it's extremely noisy. Diesel engine also without, I mean, four stroke engine also without uh, silencer will be noisy, but not so badly like two stroke engine. So, because in the case of four stroke engines, the opening and closing of inlet and exhaust are two parts, which are relatively smooth. So, this clever design of the piston size and shape does not require separate probes for suction and exhaust. Because you know, during suction and exhaust probes in the port for engine, not much of real thermodynamic operation is going to be. Because basically, you know, you take the thing in and throw the thing out. So those two uh, so-called, so to say, useless probes have been eliminated by this flavor system in the case of two stroke engine. So this is somewhat uh, helpful in reducing the high energy fluctuation. And that is why you will see that small engines, very low load engines, are typically made as two stroke because like no particles. Because uh, so little power the engine is supposed to keep. And that also, if it does not give uniformity, then uh, it may cause very, I mean, it's not very like it. Now, another engineering trick to reduce the speed fluctuation is multi fuel. Rather than having a single energy, a single and single piston, you can have several pistons operating in their own respective cylinders in different orientations or at least different phases. So at tank angle theta equal to zero, whatever is the phase of one piston, one piston cylinder, if another is 120 degree away and the third is 240 degree away, then all the time some of, of them, or most of the time, some of them will be doing power. Okay. So that is the other option. Now you see, this is typically the option for the small engines, and this is the typical option for large. So multi cylinder, you have two and two and three. So, and all the pistons give power, deliver power to the same transfer. A third possibility is don't bother to reduce the energy fluctuation, but somehow, in spite of the high energy fluctuation, manage the speed fluctuation within it. So you need an energy storage here. And flywheel is that energy storage here. It is extremely simple. It is just a body having a mass and a moment of inertia. And therefore, inertia. So when a lot of energy comes, it, I mean, since it has a lot of inertia, so to a small increase in speed, it collects that energy. And then when it is needed, to a little reduction in speed, it delivers such that energy. So that way. So flywheel is actually nothing. It's, it looks like a totally useless big body sitting there. Not sitting there, rotating. Just a high inertia wheel mounted on the crankshaft to absorb high energy fluctuation with only low speed fluctuation. And through this uh, moment of inertia, you actually relate the 
Substitution in kinetic energy and substitution in speed. If we did not put, if we had not put the flywheel, then this J would be the moment of the fact only. Okay. Thus, of course, the big end of the connection mode as it is appear. So now K max is half J omega max square minus omega max square because at omega max, it will have the maximum kinetic energy. At omega min, it will have the lowest kinetic energy. So, difference between the two. Now, when you factorize this a square minus b square, you get omega max plus omega min by 2 is to the omega average. And the remaining factor is omega max minus omega min. Now, you know that the position of fluctuation of speed is. This difference of speed divided by omega average. So take that and that extra omega average with which you are dividing to multiply here. And then a delta k max times the difference. You divide it with the total energy E, that is this MR theta. Then the coefficient of fluctuation of energy is this, which is J omega average square into Ks. Divided by which is m average in this Now, m average or mr depends on the load according to that, then you need to be using power. Capital theta is based on the design. Omega average is what you have got from the speed fluctuation, speed variation, speed, average speed at which you want to operate the thing. Ks is something which you want to have low, but KE is something which you are not bothered about loading if you are using the flywheel. Then all that you have to do is to increase it. So with flywheel, basically we replace the crank to moment of inertia J by the flywheel moment of inertia JF, which is much, much larger. So this ensures that even though Ke is high, Ks remains low. So a lot of energy gets stored without increasing the speed. Similarly, when it is needed, then a lot of energy is used up from that stored energy without reducing the speed. So the speed fluctuation Ks is low. Low Ks even with high K. That is why making this a huge value that is J. Now, between turning moment diagram and flywheel, there are three kinds of situations. One is a typical case, which we have discussed till now, which is that we have more or less covered. That is the engine producing the turning moment according to its own cycle and the resisting moment or the required moment, the load is uniform. That is this kind of case which we have discussed. Here. In a general situation, M, the turning moment might be appearing in its own cycle. The resisting moment it has its own cycle with both the variable, doesn't matter. So they crisscross the two curves crisscross each other. So there will be positive change in energy, negative, positive, negative, and so on. All that you require is high moment of inertia over the crankshaft, that is the crank itself, and any flywheel that you have mounted on that crankshaft, same shaft. And you want the average of M and MR to be same for keeping angular velocity constant over the cycle. There is a reverse typical case of this, and that is characteristic of a punching press. In a punching press, which operates mostly through an electric motor, the energy supply is electrical at constant rate. On the other hand, energy needed, the load energy, is intermittent. It is only in one cycle, it makes only one punch. So during the punch, 
the energy is really spent. So say this is the crank, this is the connecting node, this is the piston, and on the way of the piston, you put the job somewhere, and as the crank rotates, the piston comes up, it comes down and it hits it with high speed, and therefore it has high speed and high force. During this thickness T only, that much motion of the piston, the energy is really used. And after that it goes, comes out, and then again in the next cycle, by the time, the feeding mechanism has fed the next job, in the second hump. So in one cycle, one punch. So now only for a little interval of crank angle, it I want to see that you say, you need the energy spent. Less of the time, it's just moving. Unless there is no load, no resistance, it's just running the cycle. So here K max will be that energy needed over this little interval minus even within that little interval, whatever energy is produced or whatever energy is given by the motor. That is the difference in theta divided by two pi into the total energy of the cycle. So when you take E common, you get this. And this thing is maximum change in kinetic energy. This must be equal to J omega L square into K. Again, this you cannot change. Okay, this remains as it is from the demand. You want to reduce the K. So you see the high inertia of high And according to that, you will determine the J. Right? Now, if you knew R and L of the mechanism, then you and this thickness T of the job also, then you could determine theta 1 and theta 2. Not only R, L, and T, the positioning of the job. Based on that, theta 1 and theta 2 you can work out and so If you don't know the interior mechanism in detail, still based on the thickness itself and the stroke length, thickness and stroke length, of course, stroke length means you know R. But only by the stroke length and T, you can make a rough estimate for this theta 2 minus theta 1. Because if you take this, of course, it is not uniform, it's not proportional. The theta movement and the x movement here it, will, it looks more like y, they are not really proportional, but at least some estimate it will give that is movement of the piston during this tank angle interval t divided by the whole cycle. Two cycles here. Or you can say T by 4. When all the things are not known, just you know the stroke and this thickness is the thickness of the job that you are doing. Now, the last bit is that we know that the moment of inertia is larger for the same mass if the mass is located away from the axis of rotation. So, while making the flywheel, if we distribute the mass of the flywheel material away from the axis, then with less material, we can get high moment of inertia. Right? So, flywheels therefore are often made in this and rim there. So, this is the rim is basically held to the inner part and therefore the axis, the tension. This is actually shifts over the tension. And they are connected to the two number of spokes. I've shown six spokes, which is quite often the case. So mass distribution away from rotational axis is ideal with less material. And then you would say that I will make a huge flywheel other than space constraint, nothing stops me. But then, if you make a huge flywheel 
with very thin kind of section here. Then with high speed turning, the centrifugal forces may produce high circumferential space, which may damage the surface. So that is why the design gradient becomes the value of the circumferential space. So you take care that the circumferential space does not go beyond the allowable space value of the material. So, in order to design that, you basically consider half of the package, which is like this. And don't need to bother about the sports all the time. Basically, it is the ring which is really the So, if you consider half of it, then because of the circumferential space, and of course, the centrifugal force that so, how much centrifugal force? How much stress? So, because of the circular symmetry, the stress value at the entire periphery will be the same. There may be a little variation over the radial direction, but anyway, the thickness is not much because you are making the impact by doing. So, that variation you need not bother about. So, circumferentially, at every point, it will take place. Wherever you find, it is the same. So, you Take the stress sigma here, sigma here. Okay. And the cross section area is AP. This is the cross section area. Okay. So then on this half, on the other half, you are getting sigma AC force here and sigma AC force here. The total force FC is twice sigma AC. And that much force in this direction should come out from the centrifugal force. And consider the centrifugal force over a little element corresponding to angle D theta at a location and of angle D from this side. Then you will say that fine. So this DFC little amount of centrifugal force is mass of this little thing omega square into r so, and you will take maximum omega and this little mass of this circumferential element will be cross section area ac into this circumferential length of this element into density so density into cross section area into this circumferential length that is Rn into DFC. So this is the DFC. Now this DFC you can resolve into horizontal component and the vertical component. Horizontal component will be balanced exactly by a similar element on this side. It's a vertical component which will add up. So the vertical components like that you add up from theta equal to 0 to pi or add up to 0 equal to pi by 2 and w. So 0 to, two, 0 to pi by 2 and w. So the vertical element, vertical component is the sine theta. So DFC sine theta from 0 to pi by 2 and then w. So that's it. So now from this DFC, all these things except d theta are constant. So take all those things outside, twice, rho, ac, rm, into Rn, Rn square, and omega max square, only D theta remains under the integral and the sine force. So you know, so you know the sine integral of sine theta function to pi by 2 is 1. So that's why that 1 remains everything else goes on. So this is FC. And from the other side, Fc we have got to be equal to this. And when you compare these two expressions for Fc, to directly get the value of R. Twice AC goes out and sigma divided by rho over the max square. This Rm square. So you take this value, that gives you R. One parameter for the design. The mean radius is the same. And now, since this thickness is small, 
you can consider k as m iron square. It's like a ring or just a ring. So from that you get the mass of the material that you need to make the entire particle. Plus, of course, a little more mass you need for the scope and this inner part. That's it. So from that you can work out okay. But based on the mass, which is basically the length of the circumference into cross section area, into pi area, into AC, into density. So from that you get A. And your design is from here. Because you have worked out the mean radius, you have worked out the cross section area. And you can make it. Now, this gives you the moment of inertia which you want. Now, there are two sources of little extra bonus inertia. One is the spokes, which also will have their little inertia, spokes plus width. Um, and the original inertia of the crank also is there. So these two are bonus inertia terms, which you don't bother about in the because they is actually bigger than all the little stuff. So this gives you the design of the cycle, which is of course definitely straightforward. Now in the dynamic force and motion analysis, we studied the dynamic Analysis and motion analysis of the physics. Then we studied the dynamics of the simple alien. And when you assemble several such linears, you can work out the dynamics of the multicellular engine also, as we will shortly come across in the context of balancing. And then, based on the turning moment diagram, we work out. The five wheel which we typically bring. Now, machine dynamics topic will continue further in the next big subtopic that we study, and that is now till now we basically worked out dynamics in the input output relationships and so on. Now we will consider the effect of. The dynamics on the operation of the machinery and also on the foundation, the fixed plate, the foundation on which everything is anchored. And for that purpose, we will see how important is balancing, and we will then do the engineering study of that, that is how to do that. The next topic. In our course, 